Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up, the podcast for marketers working in early and late stage startups. I'm Morgan McClintic, the CEO of startup marketing agency Firebrand. We've launched this podcast to interview the best in the business, but I'm not going to do it alone. So please meet my co hosts. I'm Nicole Pytel, Firebrand's VP of Content Marketing. And I'm Chris Ulbricht, Firebrand's Head of Media Relations. I'm Ian Lipner, a tech PR and crisis communications veteran. We'll drop a new episode each week, so there's plenty of fuel for your marketing fire. Get the spark you need to take your startup to a whole new level. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up. I'm Nicole Pytel. I'm your host for today's episode today. I am joined by a very cool guest. We've got some girl power for you here on Fired Up. If you are a startup marketer, a startup founder, anybody who loves the startup world as much as we do, you are going to love today's episode because it is all about taking your startup to the next level. So let's get into it. Let me introduce our guest. So today we are joined by Michelle Denegin. She is a seasoned professional with over 20 years of experience in the startup world. As an author, speaker, and expert in marketing and strategic growth, she's dedicated her career to helping startups achieve sustainable success. Michelle is currently the chief marketing officer at an AI-powered travel platform called MindTrip and has held C-suite roles at startups such as Side, Roadster, Edmonds, eHarmony, and more. Her book, Grow Up, Take Your Startup to the Next Level, offers a comprehensive guide to navigating the challenges of scaling a startup Michelle's insights and expertise have made her a sought-after advisor and speaker, and she is very passionate about sharing her knowledge to empower founders and entrepreneurs to achieve their goals. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you literally wrote the book on how to grow a startup. So what inspired you to write it? It's interesting. It's kind of traversed my own journey you know, I've been working with startups, both in the CMO seat and as a startup advisor for a long time. You said it's seasoned, like fine wine. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's a constant theme of what I've heard along that journey, which has been sitting with me for some time, which is I'm more than a, a CMO, more than a marketer. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Hopefully that's good. But really what people have meant is I have this holistic view and understanding of startup world and the entire business, not just the marketing silo, so to speak. And so what I realized when I heard that over and over again, it forces you to reflect and say, why are people saying this and what can I do about it? And what I realized in that was I've had a front seat, literally, to dozens and dozens of founders. And if you are like me, Nicole, as a marketer, we're great at observing people and behavior. That's what we do. And I've started to really be able to hone in on what each founder's superpower is, what makes them great. But I've also seen one simple truth that most people, when I tell them this, they, they nod their head, which is what makes founders great at starting their company is not going to be the same thing that will make them great at growing it. Being able to observe people and see what their potential is and what the potential is if they can actually let go and grow and scale is really the driving force. And so I've been in an operating seat for a long time. The book for me is my way to help way more founders and startups than I can doing it kind of one or two at a time. Awesome. Well, you mentioned some superpowers. And so specifically, you talk about four superpowers that successful startup founders need. What are those superpowers? How do they work? Yep, they are four of them. So just to give you a, a brief overview of them, the, there's a personality test that is part of the book that people can take. And it's not just founders, leaders, anybody can really take it to really understand. It's based on the Myers-Briggs personality test and just really tweaked for this particular instance to figure out not just what your personality is in life, but what is the personality, AK superpower that drives you at work. And so there's four, there's the innovator. The innovator is creative, curious. They're the, the problem solver. They understand customers deeply. They find solutions to their problems, right? These are, are mad scientist types that just you're like, wow, how did you think of that? And that's a really creative way to solve a really big problem that people have. 
Then you have the builder. The builder is the person that's going to help you ramp up your company. Think about people that you know obsess over data. They put process in place. These are also the people that happen to be great at raising money because they have all the data to know that and hiring at the right time. The third superpower is the connector. And the connector is that person who knows everyone in the industry. They're connected, but they're the thought leader. They speak and with inspiration, they know everybody. They know, you know, the vacation you just took. They know your family and your, how many kids you have. They inspire people with their perspective. The persuader is analytical and action oriented. They are also a storyteller, but it's more of a means to an end, right? This is the person that you want on your team that's going to help you win customers. They're going to be the one that negotiates that really tough contract with that vendor. They're going to be the ones that will do what it takes to get things done. Those are the four. People will typically fall into one as a primary, but have a couple secondary ones. So it's not to say that you only have one superpower, you could be good at multiple things. But what I have found is if you can really tap into the one that is primary to you and embrace it, then that's really where you're going to see your strengths. And also really the exercise is more about which superpowers you're not. Where are you not able to leverage the core competencies to make that happen? And how do you surround yourself with the right people to balance that out? I love that. And I bet A lot of people are like me at this point. As you were talking, faces were popping up as you described each of the superpowers. I could think of founders and other folks in startup world that matched it to a T, but love what you say about, you know, figuring out who you are and also who you're not because who you are is great, but who you're not is super important too. So as startup marketers, what can we do to help founders leverage these superpowers, whether it's maybe helping build them up or building their team up or just making the business more superpowery. Yes, I like superpowery. That's a great term. It's such a great question. And I, like I said about myself, as marketers, I think it's in our nature to look at the world from an outsider's perspective. So chances are, if you are in the marketing seat, you're probably already aware of what your founder superpower is to some extent. If you're not, you can have them take the quiz and find out. You're also probably aware of where they might have some blind spots. This puts us in a unique position to see how founders impact the organization at large. And as marketers, it also allows us to leverage that superpower and help build up our founder and their confidence in leaning into it. So if they're the crazy innovator, put them on a pedestal and tell their story If they're a connector, get them out speaking to the industry and inspiring people. A great example of this was actually at my my last company, Side, the founder and CEO. His name is Guy Gal. That is actually his name, Guy Gal. He was an amazing connector. He hated it. He was a little introverted. And so he hated putting himself out there, but you could see it. He'd walk down the halls and he would know, you know, that your daughter just had a baby and the name and might've already sent you a gift. Like he was just gifted in connecting. And so the best way to build him up is to actually, even though he's introverted, push him outward and make sure he's aware of how good he is at that. Right. So we can really help leverage their superpower and really dive into their strengths. And that will build relationship with those founders and give us some rights to have conversations about other things that they might need in the future. We all know it is not easy to start a startup. But as you mentioned, starting growing, two very, very different things. And just because you started strong and came out of the gate strong, doesn't necessarily mean you're strong at the growth part. So what's the difference in skills that a founder needs to actually start the company versus grow the company? I would tell you nothing. And I know that's going to sound like a surprise answer, but it isn't about the founder's skills themselves. It really isn't. That is part of the issue. I think when a company first starts, the founder superpower is often the company superpower. And so it gets a little twisted and there's nothing wrong with that. What made them great is perfect. It's what made them be able to start their company. It's truly amazing. But to see real growth, Over time, that founder needs to surround themselves with people who have different superpowers. I mentioned all four of them before. They're also in the book. 
but you need a balanced team with different capabilities to truly grow. And the best analogy I have for you, Nicole, is it's like building a house, right? (laughs) If you don't have all four pillars and really strengthen them out, the house falls down. So you need to be able to put each of those pillars in place and have the confidence and trust, honestly, to allow those other people to be successful. Absolutely. So let's talk about blind spots for a second. You say that every founder has them, probably every human has them. But what do you mean by that? Much like every founder has a superpower that makes them great, they all have these blind spots, which is very different than a weakness, right? A weakness is something we know, okay, well, I'm not really all that great at, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. The blind spot is hiding in plain view. Most of the time, everybody else can see it, but you can't. That's the difference. It's like something that you just don't see in yourself. It could be no matter what you do, you just aren't going to want to hire a certain type of person or, you know, maybe you just, your blind spot is putting process in place, which by the way, a lot of innovators have as a blind spot because they want to take risks and they want to go fast. And so they don't even realize like the detriment that that has. They just think, nope, I think it gets in the way. I don't, I don't want it. So I think it's really important that people do a little bit of self-reflection. And I, that is what is different about this book. It isn't necessarily a how to follow these four things. And if you do these four things, it's really more about the psychology of the founder. And I would think of it like self-awareness, right? What do I need to get in touch with in myself in order to empower my team to be successful and to have all of those amazing core competencies that we need? So the blind spot is that one thing you can't see. I love that. And I love one that you said it's it's not a weakness, not the same thing. Doesn't necessarily mean you're weak. It's just something that you need to actually get some eyes on and fix or improve a little bit. And I also love, you know, you mentioned the psychology, you know, that was my double major in college. I could geek out on psychology all day, but I think it's really important in this case where if there was just a magical three-step formula to growing a startup, everyone would do it. We wouldn't see such a small percentage of startups that actually succeed. So I love that it's not some magical list. It really is like you've got to kind of do some personal work. And like you mentioned, the self-reflection and kind of figuring out what are you good at? What could you be a little bit better at? Where can your team lift you up? So I love that it's more of a a human-centric process than just a, you know, go do these three different types of marketing, create this type of collateral, talk to these types of people. I think that's just so much more helpful than what we would think as like some magical to-do list that's magically going to grow your startup. You mentioned some self-reflection. So if you sit down, you kind of think about what those blind spots are, then how do you conquer them? Is it something that you do on your own? Is it something that your team maybe helps you work through? Like what's the best way to kind of bring those to light and take care of them? I think the first thing is to do some self-reflection and see if you can't figure out what they are. It's not impossible, but you have to be open. So think about the things that are at the very bottom of your list, right? When you look at your to-do list, what falls day after day after day down to the bottom? Or who is that person that you are just reluctant to hire or you know, somebody in your company doing something that you think is just not that important, because usually that gives you some insight into where your blind spot sits. But your team knows, your team is aware, they're observant. And so really, if you're open enough to this, opening it up to people, and it may not be maybe you don't want to do it with your team, maybe that's a little bit too vulnerable. But people that know you well, outside of your company can also be contributors to say, look, this is what I think your amazing superpower is. But here's where I think you're just, you're not able to see what you really need. Here's your blind spot. And so those insights from other people will really help you understand where you need to focus. I think it's interesting. You said you could, if you don't want to do it with your team, you could do it with other people. Have you seen founders that are brave enough to sit down with the team and go, all right, guys, full transparency here. What do you think my blind spot is? Or is is nobody that brave? I don't think it happens that precisely where somebody's like, all right, guys, come in here. I need to figure out what my blind spot is. Let's go. But I have seen 
vulnerable, open, and like willing to grow founders get insights from their team, whether it's one-on-one or just recognizing. There was a founder in my circle who, when I was first starting to write the book, I was talking about the concept. We went to lunch and we were talking about you know superpowers and blind spots. And he had that aha moment in our conversation when he realized that they had recently done a SWOT analysis on the board as a team. And he was sitting there and he was looking at the boxes, the strengths, the weaknesses, the threats, the opportunities. And he said, those are my strengths and my weaknesses and my threats. Like that is me on a board. And he was able to go back and speak to some of the folks on his team about that and see what they thought should be brought to the table. But I I don't think it's realistic. I just think people get a little too nervous to bring that forward in that group setting. That's why I think it is better to do it with some trusted advisors, you know, along the side who are observing and watching. And it is part of what I do in my advisory world as well is to come in and help be able to untangle that a little bit with founders and their leadership team. All right, founders, you hear that? You do not have to be that brave. It can still get done. If you don't feel that brave, you are not alone. So let's talk about the business itself a little bit, because sometimes you do all these things. You've got your superpowers, you're you're figuring out your blind spots, you're building a team that is really the right support team to have around you. But sometimes startups just need to pivot. And maybe it's finding a new audience. Maybe it's providing a new offering. But how do you know when it's time to do that? What are the signs of that? Well, before we talk about the signs of what it takes to pivot, I just want to call out that pivots aren't bad. (laughs) Pivots, though they're intense and sometimes potentially feel very personal, they're necessary oftentimes to survive. They can be your greatest opportunity. And we don't think about this all the time, but there's incredible, incredible companies now that didn't start as what they are today. So a great example of that, since I know a lot of your audience is marketing professionals, they'll resonate with this, is YouTube. YouTube is a great example. Did you know that YouTube started out as a video dating website? No. (laughs) That bombed. They couldn't even get women to pay to post videos there. But out of that was born the idea to allow people to post videos and be subject matter experts about anything, right? It brought in the offering. It was kind of the same target audience, but it took off and fast forward. Now they're generating, what is it, like 30 billion plus in ad revenue. I mean, it's huge, right? So I think the very first thing to think about is embracing the pivots because they can be your greatest opportunity. If you are too rigid and you're too set in your ways that you know, we're going to make this work, you know, no matter what, then you're going to miss potentially that really great opportunity for yourself. So I think that's, that's the first thing as it relates to pivots. Big business pivots come down to really whether or not you have product market fit. Have you gained conviction in this? Do you have enough customers that aren't even just willing to use your product, but pay for it? And so that I think is really important for people to think about with pivots, right? That's kind of what happened when I was giving you that YouTube example. So it's typically when you need to pivot, you need to be very aware and keep track of what is actually happening with my customer growth. Are they truly using my product the way that I intended? And are they willing to pay for it? You could have tapped into a problem that just wasn't big enough for that. And I actually call that a little bit of the shiny puppy syndrome. <laughs> I don't know if, if you've ever heard this or if I made this up, maybe I made this up. But the shiny puppy syndrome is on the surface, when you talk to potential customers, they absolutely love what you do. They love it. They think it's incredible, right? It's kind of like seeing the puppy in the pet stores. So you're like, oh my gosh, it's such a cute puppy. I would love that puppy. I would cuddle that puppy. It would be fantastic to have that puppy. And then somebody says, well, that puppy cost X. And you're like, hmm, I don't know if now is the right time for that puppy. You know, it's going to be a lot of work to take care of that puppy. I'm going to have to buy all this stuff for that puppy. And so I think we just need to make sure 
that we really do understand that there are customers willing to pay for our product, that we're solving a big enough problem. And if we're not, that's okay. It's okay to not necessarily get it right out the gate. A lot of companies don't. Other ones like Slack, Play-Doh was not what it is now, certainly did not start that way. So there's great examples in the book, but I think the thing to remember is you have to be open. You have to be flexible. Maybe you have an incredible product for a different audience. Maybe you have an incredible audience that just needs to pivot and tweak the product to solve a bigger problem for them, right? So staying open, I think is the biggest thing there. And if you have a great team and you stay open and you can pivot, you'll survive. Yeah, absolutely. And first off, I'm going to use the shiny puppy syndrome everywhere. I'm going to tell all my product friends about it because it is amazing. No, I hadn't heard it, but I will be using it all the time. So that is amazing, first off. And yeah, I think part of it is founders are humans too. People don't want to fail, you know, and sometimes you have to fail to learn. And I think the key is you've got to get it out there. You've got to fail quickly, but there's going to be a learning associated with that. So I love how it's not necessarily a bad pivot. It's just maybe your great idea needs some work or maybe your great idea is the shiny puppy, but at least you know that you tried it and now you can figure out what does work. So I love that. You mentioned a little bit about data. We talked about data. Startup marketers, we are obsessed with data in a good way. It tells the story of what's really going on. So what metrics should startups be looking for as they're in this growth phase? You know, aside from, you know, everybody's looking at revenue or maybe, you know, new customers that they're acquiring, like those are the big obvious ones, but what else should they be measuring to see if they really are on that right track or if maybe they need a pivot or maybe they need a little bit more self-reflection? I think you hit it right on. It really depends on your growth phase. So once you're more established, everything at the end will ladder up to revenue and you'll be looking at things like, am I increasing my website traffic? Do I have enough leads and opportunities? And if you're B2B, am I getting enough sales, right? At the end of the day, it's about revenue and retention. So as you mature, that's what you start to look at. But when you're in those early, early days, there's a little bit more, I would say, qualitative nature to what you're looking at and, and measuring and trying to see if you're actually, you know, moving the needle, I would say, and building your reputation. So I think you need to ask yourself things like, do prospects, when we talk to them, do they know who we are when we call? How often is that happening when we call somebody and they're like, oh, I've heard of you, <laughs> right? Am I able to get media attention? Do we have enough I'd say media power to get out that there and to be covered in that way. Are the number of leads and referrals increasing month over month? It might still be tiny, but am I starting to see that? Am I starting to see word of mouth happen? Am I getting some referrals from somebody? You know, am I hearing that, oh, I heard about you from so and so? What does your inbound, you know, look like? And are you included in, I mean, one of the big ones for me just, I know I didn't state this before, but I'm a connector as a superpower. Um, so <laughs> knowing that our company is building its reputation, sometimes it's about, are you getting included in roundups about companies in your category, right? That's when you really know that you have started to elevate. Right now I'm with a company called MindTrip. We're in the travel space. We're a brand new early stage startup. I, I've done very early stage all the way to publicly traded companies. And one of the things that we saw that we were most proud of was out the gate, we were able to get in roundups that took every other startup kind of out of the equation. It was things like, oh, well, for AI power travel, there's OpenAI and Google Gemini and maybe Expedia and MindTrip. And that to me was one of those data points when we saw articles start to pop up like that, that said, okay, we're elevating, we're getting known. And that's really in the very beginning, what you hope for is you need to be able to start to build some recognition and awareness of your brand and watch what's happening from an inbound perspective in that way. That is so incredibly important. And we see this a lot with startups, usually early on that need awareness, but are hesitant to pay for awareness, whether that's 
paid social or paid search or even PR or anything like that, because, oh, well, it's just awareness that's not going to make me money at the end of the day. It may not make you money today, but it might make you money tomorrow. And it's it's funny you bring that up because we just started working with a new client who said, yeah, we go into pitches and they say, I've never heard of you, but your product's amazing. Why have I never heard of you? And that's such an important part of getting out there. It's this is not field of dreams. If you build it, they will not necessarily come. And so I love that you shine a light on that awareness side, because I think a lot of startups are afraid to invest in that. They're afraid to spend the money. It feels like a quote unquote waste, but it's so incredibly important as you've proven that you're getting lumped in with some of the biggest names on the planet. And without that, I mean, you could have the greatest product in the world, but if nobody knows it exists or nobody knows your company exists, yeah. Well, it also fuels all the other channels, right? So that's the thing that people don't appreciate is when I have heard your name and I've got direct response out there or I'm sending emails or paid social or or whatever, now I'm more inclined Like there are studies that show the click-through rates go up, like all across the board, awareness wins. And so one of the keys there, getting back to the superpowers and the founders though, is making sure that you are working with a founder that understands and appreciates that aspect of what you need to do early on. And that is sometimes shining a light on their superpower. Sometimes it's shining a light on their blind spot. I think that's a critical part because without that support, Look, most startups are told, run fast, get as much demand as you can. Don't worry about that building of the brand. And it takes a very specific type of founder to really understand, appreciate the foundation. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Branding, by the way, is different than advertising. Nicole, we could do a whole podcast on that. (laughs) Awesome. So some really, really great advice here. A lot about team building, self-reflection, growth, measuring growth, all of these things. So as we all know, 2024, it has been a roller coaster. Who knows what's in store for the rest of the year, but we, we know there's been a lot of ups and downs. So for all the startup founders who are listening to this right now, what is your number one tip? As we continue on this crazy, zany 2024 roller coaster. Yeah, I don't think it's year specific. I think it's really about understanding your blind spot. I think it it doesn't go out of fashion to understand yourself and leadership doesn't, you know, the needs of leadership doesn't drastically change from year to year, even though everything in front of us is constantly changing. So know that you set the temperature of the company at large know your superpower and what makes you great. Be proud of that, but don't be blind to what you need. I think that would be my biggest kind of advice. Have your leadership team take the superpower quiz. You know, it's on my website, michelledenogene.com. Make sure you have all four superpowers in play. And if you don't, go find someone to represent what you're missing, but make sure you're open to that and you don't sabotage it in the, in the process. Love it. It's like that classic little black dress never goes out of style. Right. <laughs> Michelle, this is amazing. Guys, the book is is out now. Grow up, take your startup to the next level, go grab it. If it's half as good as the conversation we've had here, you know the book is absolutely amazing. Let's switch gears. Let's have a little bit of fun, Michelle. So we're going to close out today with our fired up five. So these are some quick fire questions. We ask the questions. You give us a quick one to two sentence answer on each. Gives us all a chance to learn a little bit more about you beyond the utter brilliance that you've already shared with us. So question number one, what would you do if you weren't in marketing? You know what? I probably would be either starting my own business or in product because I am also part innovator in my background. So that would probably be where I would be. My husband and I have a thousand and one ideas for new businesses all the time. So it probably would be, or at this stage of my life, maybe I become a full-time author. I don't know. I need to recover first from writing this one and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> What's the best career advice you've ever been given? Great question. Your network is everything. Build your network, get to know as many people as you possibly can. Don't wait until you need them. Keep in touch with them. Build those relationships because that's going to be the wind beneath your sails. Love it. 
What book do you most often recommend besides yours? Yours doesn't count. I can't say mine. Man. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, for startups, I would say there's a book. It, it's not new. It's an oldie but goodie, but it was written by one of my favorite mentors, Jim Stangle, who's the former global marketing officer at Procter & Gamble. He wrote a book called Grow, which I know my book is called Grow Up. That's confusing, but <laughs> the book was called Grow and it's on building purpose into your company, which is so powerful. I don't think enough companies start with this in mind. What is your purpose beyond the product that you offer? How are you helping to elevate society and how do you embrace it in building your reputation? I just, it was very impactful for me at the time that I read it all those years ago. And so it's still my go-to when people ask me that question. What's the strangest job you've ever done? We've had some good answers to this question. This, this is where it gets real. Yeah, this one is the best, I think. I don't know. You'll tell me. <laughs> I worked for a company. So uh, I've been around the block for a little while. Uh, my career kind of started when the internet was nascent. But I worked for a company when I was in college called 1-800-GO-FIND-IT. And I was an operator there. And legitimately, Nicole, this is what they did. You would call 1-800-GO-FIND-IT. As an operator on the other side of the phone, I would use this thing called the internet. And I would go seek out information about whatever you were asking about, a restaurant or whatever it was. And I would tell you about it and give you their contact information. You were like a human Google before there was Google. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> amazing. That's a good one. That's good. We're going to add that to like the Fired Up Hall of Fame. That was a good one. Finally, what are you excited about either professionally, personally, about the second half of 2024? I mean, so much, first of all, um, growing the mind trip brand, because that's, you know, first and foremost for me being in an operating role as a CMO, continuing to educate on my grow framework and helping as many startup founders as I possibly can. And then on a personal front, I have two teenagers in my house. So probably just surviving teenagehood would be a great goal for the second half of 2024. <laughs> That last one might be the hardest of them all. So, hey, awesome. Michelle, it has been such a pleasure. We are so excited to have you on here. I know our, our audience learned a ton from you. If people want to find you, where where can they go? Yep. Uh, you can go to my website, michelledenogene.com. There's a contact information there. And then you can also find me at Michelle Denogene on all social platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, <laughs> you name it. It's fun to have a very unique name like that. There's not competing with a whole lot of people. So I'll thank my husband for a very unique last name. Thank you, husband. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Great episode. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And we will see you next time on Fired Up. Thanks, Nicole. Well, that wraps it up for today. But two quick things before we go. First, we've just published our Startup Marketer Outlook, which is a report based on a survey of over 250 senior marketers, uh, early and late stage startups, all about their plans for H2 2024. So please go to firebrand.marketing and in the resources section, you'll be able to download your copy there. Second, if you've enjoyed the show, please give us a rating or a review, obviously subscribe we really appreciate that since that helps others discover the show thank you for listening and we'll see you next week and in the meantime get out there and crush your marketing goals